see. Okay, well, I think we're pretty well here. Okay, so uh, order of events for today, Carpal Bones Quiz, uh, wrap up chapter 7, uh, start chapter 8, and then uh, group activity for those four items. So do you have any questions? So I am working through your, your exams. Um, won't be posted for a few days. Once they're posted, then you, you're able to come and uh, talk hours if you want to go over uh, your exam. Okay, so uh, just need to have uh, uh, something to write with. Um, laptops closed, cell phones put away. Uh, let's go ahead and take this quiz. Shouldn't take you too long. No surprises. Done if you just want to raise your hand and I can come around and collect it.
down and just, just relax. Thank you. Brian, if you want to take the quiz just right after class, you can do that. Don't worry about it. Can I get everybody? All right. A few more minutes. So rest of chapter seven. <clears throat> okay, so let's re review a few things. So uh, common name for muscles that act on the wrist. So if a muscle acts on the wrist, how would you know based on the name? Carpi, yeah, carpi, okay. So common muscles that act on the thumb. Glissies, okay. Muscles that act on the fifth digit. Well, that's half of it. Digity mini me, okay. So if a muscle has action in abducting the wrist, how would you know based on the name? What would be in the name based on the the name would indicate lateral or medial side. Radialis, right? Okay, so then muscles that adduct the wrist or ulnar deviation, how would you know? Flexor carpi ulnaris. Yeah, so there's a few, few names in common. How many muscles do we have acting on the wrist and hand that are considered intrinsic? So what does intrinsic mean? in the context of the wrist and hand. Yeah, so the origin and insertion are all within the, the hand, basically. Okay. So uh, you have a total of how many muscles are, would be considered intrinsic? 18. 18, okay, so we have four on this side, 
And all four of those act on the thumb, right? So we have an abductor, we have an adductor, we have an opponent, and we have a flexor. Okay. So Courtney brought up an interesting point last time. We have three that act on the fifth digit. Uh, we have we have we have an abductor. Okay. What else do we have? We have a flexor. We have an opponent. What are we missing that's not that's present on the thumb, but not over here? The adductor, right? A B D adductor. Okay, so that's seven. So we're still looking for eleven. So how many lumbar cows do we have? Okay, four lumbar cows, dorsal interosseae. Four palmar interosseae. Maybe three, three more. So what's the difference between the palmar and dorsal interosseae? So those are the muscles that pull the fingers apart and then bring the fingers back together. So your, your three palmar interosseae uh, bring the fingers back together. So that'd be adduction at what joints? What do we call these joints? What's the formal term for the knuckle joints? So where? Metacarpal phalangeal. Metacarpal phalangeal. So where the uh, metacarpals meet the base of the proximal phalanx. Uh, so metacarpal phalangeal. So the uh, palmar interossei bring the fingers together. Dorsal interossei spread spread the fingers apart. Uh, so uh, let's let's continue here. Let's go over some of these uh, specific muscles. So one more question: What three nerves? I'm not going to ask you the muscles yet, but what what three nerves are there that are relevant to the muscles of the wrist and hand? Median. Okay, so that's good, right down the middle, right? Radial. Radial, which is everything on the posterior side, right? So pretty much everything that extends plus the adductor pollicis longus, abductor pollicis longus is radial nerve. Okay, so we've got median nerve, which is right down the middle, radial nerve, which is around the back. What do we have on the medial side? Ulnar, Ulnar nerve. So those those three. So you need to memorize the muscles that are associated with uh, each of those three for innervation. So it's just, just a matter of repetition with those. So uh, getting into some of these muscles and looking at attachment points, so uh, origin and insertion points. So we have a flexor carpi radialis muscle. So you know for sure it's a flexor and an abductor or radial, we could say radial deviator of the, of the wrist. Uh, and so the point of origin is very common to many of the muscles that flex the wrist and fingers. So we have some very common uh, points of origin. Uh, it'd be the medial epicondyle. So right up here, the medial epicondyle and then you see the muscle kind of crosses over to the lateral side and has its insertion at the base of the second and third metacarpals. So um, a muscle will act on all the joints that it crosses. So when we say a muscle crosses a joint, that means that it has impact in moving that joint. So you notice some things up here that might seem a little confusing, weak flexion. Of the elbow. So we know that the, the biceps brachii, brachial radialis, brachialis, those are the, the primary flexors of the elbow, but technically this muscle has its origin just above the elbow joint, just above the humeral ulnar joint. So it does act uh, as a weak flexor of the elbow. Um, it also crosses the radial ulnar joints, so both the, the proximal and the distal radial ulnar joints. So it is involved with uh, pronation. Okay, so we have the pronator teres, which kind of looks like this muscle in, in its alignment. Pronator quadratus, which was down closer to the, closer to the wrist. So it would contribute to pronation. Um, and then it crosses the wrist joint. So what's the formal term for the wrist joint? 
Kind of like how the elbow is the humeral ulnar joint. So the yeah, wrist is the radiocarpal joint. Radiocarpal joint because it's, it's the enlarged portion of the radius, which is more distal, uh, combined with the first three carpal bones. So uh, scaphoid, lunate, uh, and triquetral bones make up the primary articulation of the wrist. Um, so that's its, that's its last function. That's the last joint uh, that it crosses um, is the wrist joint. Okay, so palmaris longus. Uh, this is a muscle that actually is, is only present in 80% of the population. So there's a lot of anatomical variation. Um, this, is, this is a muscle that doesn't cross through the carpal tunnel, right? So it has, it's a, it has a long tendon that's readily available uh, for you, the ulnar collateral ligament surgery, the Tommy John surgery. Um, it has this very broad uh, aponeurosis. So uh, an aponeurosis is, is a tendon that's more of a sheet-like versus cord-like. Um, so that's a protective cover for underlying arteries and nerves and so on. Um, so same side of origin again. Okay, so take a look. Medial epicondyle uh, crosses down through the forearm and has its insertion right across here, so right across the metacarpals. So right, right in the palm of your hand uh, has all of its attachments. Okay, so extensor carpi ulnaris. So from the name, you should be able to identify it's, it's an extensor of the wrist. Uh, and because it's ulnaris, it would be ulnar deviation or, or adduction of the wrist. Um, so, a lot of the extensor muscles, uh, in contrast to the flexor muscles, have their origin up here at the lateral epicondyle, so just, uh, just on the opposite side. Um, and because of that, it does have some weak action in extending the elbow, kind of like how the other flexor muscles were involved in flexing the elbow. So it's a very strong wrist extensor, and it has its insertion down here on the ulnar side, just right here at the base of the fifth uh, metatarsal, base of the fifth uh, metacarpal, I should say. Okay, extensor carpi radialis brevis. So usually where there's a brevis, there's also a longus. And so same side of origin, okay, so right up here, lateral epicondyle, um, it's a radialis, which means radial deviation or abduction. Um, and it has its insertion here at the base of the third, uh, base of the third metacarpal. Okay, extensor carpi radialis longus. So just similar functions. Um, has its origin slightly up higher at the lateral supracondylar ridge and then drops down the lateral side to, to insert here at the base of the second um, metacarpal. Okay, flexor digitorum superficialis. So this is a muscle named based on its function and also its location. Function and location. So it's, it's closer to the skin surface um, and it's a flexor of the digits. Um, I want you to note on this muscle just how far the tendons go down into the digits. So we studied before we have two joints, at least the four, the four fingers. The thumb is kind of different, but the four fingers here have a proximal interphalangeal and a distal interphalangeal. So what was the functional classification of the interphalangeal joints? Yeah, hinge, they, they flex and they extend, right? So if, if we look at this muscle, it, as expected, it has its origin up here, medial uh, epicondyle as well, as well as just below the coronoid process there, and even a little bit on the shaft of the radius, but it goes down all the way past 
all the way past the proximal interphalangeal joint. So it's, it, it, we leave out that last interphalangeal joint is not affected uh, by this muscle. So it would flex all the way to right there with the proximal uh, interphalangeal joints. Um, do we have another muscle though that's similar to the flexor digitorum superficialis? A little deeper, and uh, it's right here. So I want you to notice how far these tendons go down into the fingers. So with the flexor digitorum profundus, the tendons go all the way to the bottom. So now uh, we are crossing the metacarpal phalangeal, the proximal interphalangeal, and the distal the distal interphalangeal. So we're, we're going all the way down here. So this is the muscle that flexes the distal interphalangeal joints. Um, something else uh, about this muscle, if, if I was to say, okay, so this flexes the metacarpophalangeal joints. What's the functional classification of, of the metacarpophalangeal or knuckle joints? Yes, condyloid, very good. So it's just like the wrist. So condyloid is unique because it has two planes. So kind of like the wrist and the metacarpophalangeal are, are unique. Uh, condyloid means, means biplanar, so there are two. We have lots of uh, classifications that are just one plane or multi-planes, but not very many that have two. Okay, flexor pollicis longus. Okay, so flexor of the thumb, and so this one has its origin up here, close to the coronoid, oops, close to the coronoid process, uh, and then the shaft of the radius, and then down here, just past uh, the interphalangeal joint of the thumb. So this would be a, a thumb flexor, right? All the way down through all the joints of the thumb. So, we have the cellar joint, right? The cellar joint. What's the carpal bone that makes up the cellar joint? Trapezium. Tra Trapezium. Trapezium. Very good, Connell. Trapezium. And then we have the metacarpal phalangeal joint of the thumb, which is classified as what? It's kind of a trick question. The knuckle joint of the thumb. This is the uh, uh, okay. Cellar joints down here. That's the trapezium and base of the first. Uh, metatarsal, metacarpal, getting down to the foot already, okay? So these are condyloid, the metacarpophalangeal joint of the four fingers. The metacarpophalangeal joint of the thumb is ginglemus. So you have cellar or saddle joint, and then the knuckle joint of the thumb is ginglemus, and then the interphalangeal joint of the thumb is also uh, ginglemus. So just from the review activity last week, that's just to review. Okay, so extensor digitorum. This is the big extensor muscle of the fingers because you have tendons that go down each of the fingers. So I think it's fascinating how uh, this muscle divides into four separate tendons as it goes under the extensor retinaculum. <laughs> So as it crosses the wrist joint, it divides into four different tendons that go all the way down <coughs> to the distal phalanx of each, each finger. So it's a complete extensor, extensor of the elbow, extensor of the wrist, extensor of the metacarpal phalangeal, proximal interphalangeal, distal interphalangeal. So extension of all those joints. <coughs> So extensor indices, uh, you can see that's the index finger. So coming down uh, has, it's just a little muscle um, having its origin here uh, near, the, near the head of the ulna, head of the ulna is down here. And then coming down all the way to the proximal and distal phalanx there. So it's you can even pick that one out because it's. You can see the tendon as you, if you, 
kind of get your extensor muscle go in there. You can see the, the tendon of that muscle in your index finger. Okay, extensor digiti mini me, kind of the same, only different digits. So the fifth digit here um, has its origin up here at the lateral epicondyle, and then drops over to the ulnar side, all the way down to the distal phalange of the fifth digit. So if you, you can also look and see if you can see that tendon as you extend that digit. So why does the pointer finger and pinky have the extra extensor muscles in the lateral epicondyle? Uh, that's a good question. You ask all the good questions. Um, so you're saying, why does the index and fifth digit have an extra? Yeah, um, yeah digitor muscle does reach all of them. Uh, I don't know. Could be, could be leverage with with gripping and and um, I know that. Well, that wouldn't. I have to think about that one. That's a good question. Okay, so extensor pollicis, right? Extensor of the thumb. Okay, so you're going down here, the base of the, uh, the distal phalange there of the thumb. So extensor of the, of the thumb. So all the way past, here's the cellar joint right here, trapezium with the base of the first metacarpal, cellar joint, metacarpal phalangeal joint of the thumb, interphalangeal joint of the thumb there. Okay, so brevis, um, so these two muscles are part of what anatomical structure? That triangular, let me zoom in, anatomical snuff box is made up of the extensor, uh, extensor pollicis longus brevis and abductor pollicis. So those three tendons. Um, the extensor pollicis brevis shares a tendon with the um, abductor pollicis brevis that we'll see here in just a moment. So this is the abductor pollicis longus that has its insertion right there at the cellar joint, the base of the first uh, metacarpal there. So that's right on the cellar joint. And so, uh, so the point I brought up, anatomical snuff box um, is the extensor pollicis longus, uh, extensor pollicis brevis, and then not shown uh, would be abductor pollicis brevis. Um, so this muscle and the abductor pollicis brevis uh, have a common tendon uh, that makes up the lateral part of that uh, anatomical snuff box. Okay, so end of chapter seven. So um, any questions that you have? Do we need to know each muscle's origin and position? Just generally speaking, like last time. So you would know generally that uh, a flexor of the wrist originates where? Medial epicondyle. Generally, uh, a lot of the wrist extensors originate where? Lateral epicondyle, right? Questions, questions like that. Um, okay, so let's, let's keep going. Pelvic girdle. So there's a lot of similarities between the shoulder joint and shoulder girdle um, and the hip joint and pelvic girdle. Okay, so remember your first page of your movement muscles handout shows you the corresponding actions of the shoulder joint and shoulder girdle. Um, it's very similar because you have corresponding actions of the hip joint and uh, pelvic girdle. So the muscles that are able to stabilize the pelvic girdle are really important, kind of like the muscles that stabilize the shoulder girdle. Um, muscles that act on the pelvic girdle don't necessarily act on the hip joint. So separate group of muscles, but both are important. We want the pelvic girdle and shoulder girdle fixed so that muscles that move the shoulder joint and the hip joint can work uh, properly, can apply uh, greater force. Okay, so the hip joint is called the acetabulofemoral joint. 
So joints are typically named according to the structures that articulate. So articulate means coming together, as in a joint. So we have the acetabulum of the pelvis and the femoral head. Um, as I was preparing this lecture last night, I just found several really interesting things about uh, anatomical variation. Um, and we start to see that in all regions of the body. Um, so I'm going to bring, bring in some anatomical variation and also talk about the practical application, because that's, that's really what we want, is, is how can I take this and apply it? So we'll get into that. Um, so it's more stable than the shoulder. So it's still a ball and socket joint, but it has lots of thick ligaments, lots of big muscles. It's got a very deep socket. So what do we call the socket at the shoulder, remember? Yeah, glenoid fossa. So the acetabulum at the hip is, is a lot deeper. So it has more stability, likely due to its uh, weight-bearing uh, function. So remember, ball and socket, the formal term is uh, interthrodial. Okay, so if you like, if you can remember ball and socket easier, then just go with that. That's fine. Um, okay, so the pelvic girdle itself is made up of three bones. So you need to know these. Uh, that's, a, that's a good test question. So three bones that make up the pelvic girdle. Kind of like how many bones make up the shoulder girdle? Two, right? Clavicle and scapula. So the pelvic girdle has three. So you have the right and left hip bones. Hip bones are sometimes called oscoxa. Oscoxa. So again, on an exam, if, if you'd rather say hip bone than oscoxa, that's fine. So we have the right and left oscoxa joined together by uh, the sacrum. The sacrum is made up of five fused vertebrae. So uh, the articulation between the oscoxa and the sacrum is at the sacroiliac joints. So you have a little bit of movement at these, at these joints. So it's not one just one rigid static structure. There's some, some movement that is really nice uh, because um, we want a little bit of give to these joints um, during uh, walking and running and so on. Okay, so some of the ligaments that are external to the joint capsule, uh, very important for hip stability. So ligaments are oftentimes named according to the segments that are joined together. So we have the iliofemoral ligament. And so here colored in, in red. And so each oscoxa has three different parts. And um, I'm getting just a little bit ahead of myself, but just know for now. Uh, each oscox or hip bone has an ilium, an ischium, and a pubis. And so the reason for uh, naming this ligament like that is because it connects the femur with the femur with the ilium part of each hip bone. Uh, the pubofemoral ligament. So connecting in green here, connecting the femur with the pubis. Part. So again, each hip bone has an ilium, an ischium, and a pubis, and so that's where we get the names for these ligaments. Um, if we go around the posterior side, um, we have one more, and that's the ischiofemoral. So connecting the ischium of the hip bone, or oscoxa, to uh, the femur. Okay, so if we go underneath the external supporting ligaments, uh, we have a joint capsule. Um, so a fibrous type of capsule, um, sometimes called a synovial capsule because on the inside, it's lined with this uh, special connective tissue membrane called uh, the synovial membrane or synovium. So you can see here, just in green outline, just the interior lining of the joint capsule or synovial capsule. And that's very important because uh, during loading and unloading, the uh, joint capsule secretes fluid. And that provides oxygen and glucose um, and other nutrients to the articular cartilage here. 
the articular cartilage covers the femoral head and also lines the, the acetabulum, so acetabulum here. Okay, so on the anterior side, the pelvic bones join at the symphysis pubis. So that's a fibral cartilage disc that joins the pelvic bones anteriorly. Um, this is an amphiarthroidal type of joint. So that means there's, there's a slight amount of movement. So remember from a few chapters ago when we went over uh, joint classifications? We have synarthrodial, which is immovable, amphiarthrodial, which is slightly movable, and then diarthrodial, which is, which is highly movable. And so most of the time we look at the diarthrodial ones, but um, there's a few cases where I like you to learn the other ones. So the symphysis pubis would be a, a slightly movable amphiarthrodial joint. Okay, so posteriorly, as I already mentioned, you have the sacroiliac joints. Okay, and these are also considered to be amphiarthrodial. So just a slight amount of movement. The sacrum itself is uh, one segment, consists of five vertebrae that are fused together. Uh, the coccyx, which is underneath the sacrum, uh, consists of four uh, fused vertebrae. So, all together, we have 33 vertebrae, but there's only 24 that are movable. So the last nine are, are fused uh, together. So the os coxa, so the right and left hip bones, right and left os coxa are divided into three areas. So the upper two fifths is called the ilium. The lower posterior and lower two fifths is called the ischium, and the anterior one fifth is, is called the pubis. So don't confuse the three bones of the pelvic girdle with the three bones that make up each hip bone. Does that make sense? So three bones of the pelvic girdle, right and left, os coxa or hip bone, and the sacrum. And then if you're looking at each individual os cox or hip bone, it has these three, these three parts. So up to about uh, 16 to 18 years of age, these bones are separate. So they're separated by this triradiate cartilage. So this is essentially uh, about, at about 16 to 18 years of age, this will undergo ossification. So what does that word ossification mean, you think? Yeah, it turns into bone. So what's left, the remnant of the triradiate cartilage, is this growth plate, this epiphyseal line. So that happens at about 16 to 18 uh, years old. Prior to that point, there are three separate bones. So you have the ilium, the pubis, and the ischium. Okay, so let's go over a, a few of the prominent landmarks. The pelvis has several different points that are important for muscle attachment. I want you, when you, when you think about muscles that act on the hip joint, location is really important in determining function. So muscles that have points of origin on the front of the pelvis. So if you're talking about the front of the pelvis, a couple of really important landmarks would be the anterior superior iliac spine right here, as well as the anterior inferior iliac spine. So muscles that, that originate on those structures function to flex the hip joint. Um, if we go to the lateral side of the pelvis, the lateral side of the pelvis, just underneath the iliac crest here, so just underneath this crest, you have the origin of muscles that abduct the hip joint. 
Um, if we go around to the back side, getting down here, this is the lower two fifths, posterior and inferior. Uh, this is the ischium. Okay, so one of the one of the important landmarks on the ischium would be this ischial tuberosity, right here, this roughened surface. Uh, sometimes the ischial tuberosity uh, is referred to as the sit bone because that's where the pressure is when you're when you're in a seated position. Um, this structure, this ischial tuberosity, is also the point of origin for the hamstring muscles. So the hamstrings are oftentimes uh, activated with uh, hip dominant extension. So Romanian style deadlifts and so on would activate the hamstrings from the hip joint. And so all three of the hamstrings have attachments right here at this ischial uh, tuberosity. Um, if we go to the medial side, you have a couple of ramus. So the inferior ramus of pubis right here, as well as the superior ramus of pubis. These structures provide uh, points of attachment for muscles that adduct the hip. So as we look at uh, each pelvic bone, the, there are definitely important parts where muscles attach that, that control flexion, extension, abduction, and then also adduction of the hip. Okay. All right, so let's, let's get into a little more detail here. So this would represent a cross section from a sagittal view. So what you're looking at here is a right hip bone. You're looking at the last two lumbar vertebrae, so L4, and L5, and then the sacral and coccygeal vertebrae here. Okay, so a couple important parts. This part right here represents what we call the greater sciatic notch. Down here we have what's called the lesser sciatic notch. So if I was to go back, and without the ligament pictures, okay, so if I was to go back, you can see those two parts can see those two parts right here. So this is the greater sciatic notch right here, and then this is the lesser sciatic notch right here. So now going forward, if, if we start to add some ligaments into this, okay, the ligament on the back, it's more longitudinal. This is called the sacrotuberous ligament. So that's, that's the first ligament that you need to memorize, the sacrotuberous ligaments. You want to highlight that in your notes. <coughs> the other ligament that forms this, this foramen, this greater sciatic foramen, is the sacrospinous ligament. So its fibers are more horizontal. So what I've provided up here is just some different views. So this is, this is a sagittal view. If we, if we cut the pelvis in half, just looking at the right os coxa with the spine and the greater uh, sciatic notch, lesser sciatic notch, we put the ligaments running across the back and kind of making a floor. And we have this foramen, this greater sciatic foramen. Up here, what I've included up here is uh, this would be an anterior view. This would be an anterior view. So you're looking at the right uh, hip bone and then you're looking straight into this greater sciatic foramen here with the sacrospinous ligament and sacrotuberous ligament. So can you see how these are the same? It's just a different, it's just a different viewpoint. Okay, and then this is a posterior view last. So this would be looking at the back. So right here, the greater sciatic foramen and then the lesser sciatic foramen would be down here. Okay, so let's get into some application here. So the very last line that I wrote here, the piriformis muscle passes through the foramen and occupies most of the volume. So what that means is we have this tiny little muscle that mostly functions as an external rotator of the hip that passes right through 
this greater sciatic foramen and occupies most of its volume. So most of the space right here is occupied by that piriformis muscle. Now here's the problem. Also in that part, you have what's called the sciatic nerve. Okay, so there's, there's a lot of anatomical variation in how the sciatic nerve passes or inner, um, is, is positioned relative to the piriformis. So you have four potential options in this case, four different variants. So the sciatic nerve has two parts, okay, as we'll see later on. So that's why you have, you might be wondering, well, I see two nerves, okay? So the sciatic nerve has two parts. It has a common fibular part that's more lateral, and it has a tibial part that's more uh, medial. So in this case, you can see the, the greater sciatic notch, right here, you can see the sacrospinous ligament right here. And so you can see most of the volume of that greater sciatic notch is occupied by the piriformis muscle. In this case, the sciatic nerve is going underneath it. So what I think is interesting is these other three variations. So you have parts of the sciatic nerve going above and below. Okay, that's interesting. You even have parts of the sciatic nerve going through the muscle itself, or both parts going through the muscle itself. So why would this be a problem? This space right here. What would happen if the piriformis muscle gets damaged or is really overactivated and tight? Compress the it would compress the nerve. So you have a, first of all, you have pain loss of motor and sensory function all the way down the leg on, on that side. So for people that sit a lot, like students and professors, okay, um, very important to stay on top of mobility exercises that keep that piriformis nice and relaxed. So how can we do that? Well, we can do stuff like this. How many of you have done a similar stretch. As I was putting this together, I almost wanted us just to everybody do this stretch on. I wonder if these tables would even. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not try it. This is new. I hate to break anything. But when you get home tonight, okay, or the next time you have a chance, try doing this type of stretch on both sides. This is one of those stretches you should be doing at least once a day on both sides. Um, feels great once you loosen up uh, that muscle. So you also have a lot of other muscles in that region as well, but this is the one that passes right through that uh, greater sciatic foramen. Is that a question? Yes. So like with athletes, especially runners, like mm -hmm. I know quite a few that pinch their sciaticas, does that mean that they most likely have one of those types that runs through? Yes. Um, or it could just be a tight muscle. Yeah. So this is like kind of an everyday thing. Just night and day. Um, very important. Okay. So bony landmarks. So anterior pelvis. Said hip flexors, right? Okay. So here's some of those landmarks. So tensor fascia lata. Tensor fascia lata. Has this point of origin on the anterior iliac crest anterior iliac crest. Uh, sartorius, so anterior superior iliac spine. So you probably, the acronym ASIS, right? So that's, that's the sartorius. Sartorius is the longest muscle and it has kind of a strap or belt type um, uh, design to it. Uh, rectus femoris, okay anterior inferior iliac spine. Uh, a good question is regarding the rectus femoris is it's the only muscle of the quadriceps group that acts at both the hip and the knee joints. So all the other vasti muscles uh, extend the knee. Rectus femoris is both a, a, a hip flexor and a knee extensor. 
So I'm excited for next week because we are testing uh, the rectus femoris and vastus medialis uh, with two exercises in lab. We'll be doing the, the knee extension and a squat, a squat variation. And I'm really excited to show you the difference in quadricep activation between the rectus femoris and vastus medialis between the knee extension and, and squat. So, and it has a lot to do with the attachment of the rectus femoris at the anterior, uh, inferior iliac spine. So there is a difference. Uh, lateral pelvis, okay, so said before, hip abductors. Okay, so gluteus medius and minimus, okay, just underneath uh, the iliac crest on the lateral side. So these are muscles that in a closed chain position help to keep the pelvis level. So they are very important, especially for distance runners. Okay, so if you're in a single leg stance and a single leg stance is closed chain, why is it closed chain versus open chain? Okay, so I have one foot planted on the ground. Okay, so I still have my hip abductors that are active. Okay, so what's happening is if I have my right knee up, I've got the hip, the gluteus medius on this side that's keeping the pelvis level. So if my gluteus medius is weak, where's my pelvis gonna go? It's gonna drop to the side of the foot that's off the ground. So to keep the pelvis level with one foot off the ground, like we do with walking and more so with running, we have to have activation, strong activation of that muscle. So guess what? If the gluteus medius is weak and I'm in this single leg stance, the pelvis is gonna tilt in this direction. And then the knee tends to go into more of a valgus position and then the ankle has more stress on it. So can you see how everything right here in the lumbo-pelvic area, muscles that attach to the pelvis and control the pelvis, if, if those are deactivated, how it can interfere with alignment all the way down the extremity. So we have to address muscles that are right here in that lumbo-pelvic area, because if that's stable, then we get better alignment uh, down the lower extremities. Okay, so here's a picture of the gluteus media. So it's a lateral uh, pelvic stabilizer in the, in the frontal plane. So you have this origin just below the iliac crest. So this would be a right uh, os coxa, side of origin, and then uh, the fibers come down. So it has a radiate type arrangement, fibers that are tapering down to attach here at the greater uh, trochanter. So it's perfectly positioned to abduct uh, the hip or stabilize the, the pelvis in closed chain position. Okay, so here's kind of a zooming out to see uh, a look at how the femur articulates with, with the pelvis. So um, acetabulofemoral joint, you have the greater trochanter out here, and then you have a lesser trochanter down here, um, let's go forward just a little bit, and I want to show you some different angles. So this connection between the femoral head and the acetabulum is, can be different. So we can have some anatomical variation there. So this would be normal, okay, so this 125 degrees, if it's a little more flat, okay, we call that coxibera. And then if it's greater than 125 degrees, we call this coxa valgus, like this, okay? So furthermore, you can really get into all this. this and I'm not gonna test you on this, okay? This is, I, I really want you to have everything, all the information available to you. So you all can also have differences in angles here. So this is what we call the center edge angle. So the edge that we're talking about is right here, the edge of the acetabulum relative to the center of the femur. 
So this angle right here. Okay. This is looking at uh, the hip joint from a superior view now. Okay. Um, so you have this connection, the femoral head, the acetabulum right here. So most people, the angle we could say is a little bit retroverted. So most people, the angle between the femoral head and the acetabulum would run kind of like this in the anatomical position. Okay, now if you can imagine, you can also have this type of increase in retroversion. So retroversion is this way, okay? So if we're moving this up here, so moving this whole thing, if we're moving it up here in the anatomical position, that, that would be increased retroversion. Increased retroversion. This is normal, so slightly retroverted. And then back here where you see this picture, this way, that's antiversion. So what is, what is the functional significance of that? Okay, so if you have a normal angle or if you have a little bit more retroversion, so if your femoral head connects with the acetabulum like this, if it's coming down this way, you're gonna have a lot of hip external rotation and very little hip internal rotation. Okay, so as you're sitting there, I want you to put, just put your hand over your knee joint as you're sitting there, dorsiflex the ankle joint, just in your seat. And I want you to do just a quick self-assessment. I want you to internally rotate and I want you to externally rotate. Tell me if you notice any difference, internal and external, okay? So if you're normal or have an increased amount of retroversion, you're going to have a lot of external rotation, very little internal rotation. Okay, so let's say the opposite. So let's say you have more of what you see pictured here. This, the femoral head is more in front, the greater trochanter in back. So this is what we call antiversion. Okay, so with antiversion, what you're going to get is a lot of internal rotation and very little external rotation. So any observations? What did you notice? Any, did you have about the same internal and external or was one more than the other? A lot more internal. A lot more internal? Okay. A lot more internal? Okay. Who was more external? Okay, I'm a lot more external for me. Okay, so what is the functional implications of that? Let's take this out to the practical realm. Okay, so if you are normal to increased retroversion, you're going to do better on a barbell back squat with your feet rotated out just a little bit more. Okay, so that's the functional implication because of the anatomy of your hip joint, if you're normal or more retroverted, so that means this angle coming down right here in the anatomical position, the connection between the femoral head and the greater trochanter, it's coming down just like this, so the pelvis is a little bit back. You're gonna do better on a barbell back squat with your feet rotated out just a little more, okay? What if you're someone that has a lot of internal and very little external? So we're talking about more antiversion, okay? You're going to do better on a barbell back squat. You're going to get a little more range of motion with your feet uh, more straight ahead. So your toes more uh, facing forward versus rotated out. Okay, so that's kind of a kind of a practical tip. So a lot of external, you want to rotate your feet out. A lot of internal, you're going to have your toes pointed more straight ahead, and that will that will help you have the ideal. Uh, hip joint movement when you squat. Okay, all right, so within the hip joint itself, we have a ligament that attaches to the femoral head. This is called the ligamentum teres. It has blood vessels in it to supply 
the bone that makes up the head of the femur. It also has a function because as we abduct the hip, as we abduct the hip, this ligament is going to provide for some stability. It's going to get tight. As we abduct the hip, that ligament is going to tighten to help with uh, stability of the hip joint. Okay, so a few more slides and we'll go to our group activity. So medial pelvis, uh, origin for the hip adductors. Okay, so we have lots of adductors, magnus, longus, brevis, uh, pectineus, and gracilis. So the pubis and its inferior ramus, those are the sites on the hip bone uh, for origin of those muscles. Okay, so lastly, on the posterior pelvis, okay, we have the origin for the hip extensors. So for the gluteus maximus, the posterior iliac crest, posterior sacrum, and the coccyx. So the gluteus maximus, largest muscle in the body, the extensor muscle, primary extensor muscle of the hip. Okay, there's one more slide I want to show you. It would be good at this point. Let me... One that I wanted to end off on that I'll just put right. Let's end on this one right here, and then for Wednesday we'll go back. Okay, so I found a great study uh, from 2001, Laurel et al., that looked at the interaction of the gluteus maximus and hamstrings uh, with different angles at the hip. Okay, so in interpreting this information, first of all, um, percent MVIC, that stands for a percentage of maximal voluntary isometric contraction. So that's, that's how you express uh, EMG data. So you take the millivolts, and we looked at millivolts this morning in lab, the millivolts during a movement, and then the millivolts during a maximal contraction, and that's the percentage. So a higher percentage means more activation. So this is your y-axis. That's the percent activation for the gluteus maximus, those are the triangles right here. The hamstrings, those the squares. And then the torque, torque output, that's interesting, are these diamond-shaped structures here for each of these hip angles. So there were four angles that were measured. Okay. All right. So first thing. Okay. So at zero degrees, the hips are going to be fully extended. So for this study, that's what that meant. The hips are completely extended. So that would be this position right here. Hips are extended and that would be the zero degree point right here. Does everybody, everybody follow me on that? Okay, so at the bottom here, that would be 90 degrees. Can you see how the hips are at 90 degrees here? Okay, so let's talk about torque to start off with. So as we go from uh, the top position, okay, back down to the bottom or from the bottom back up to the top, the greatest amount of torque was produced right here at the bottom position. So it's almost like as you as you go from this point where your hips are at 90 to this point where your hips are at, in this study it was zero degrees, the torque tends to decline. So what that means is that your leverage, your mechanical advantage for, for this movement, this hip extension movement, your mechanical advantage is greatest at the bottom with less advantage at the top. And, and we see that for lots of different movements where at some points in the movement, you're stronger than other points. So like for a bench press, where, you, where are you weakest? Yeah, closer to the chest is where it's the most difficult and then you kind of, you get more leverage as you, as you move closer to the top. So same thing with, with the hips here. So let's look at gluteus maximus EMG. So that's how active the muscle is. So oftentimes we can say, okay, well, if you have less leverage, what are the consequences for a muscle if you have less leverage? Is that muscle going to have to work harder 
or is it easier for a muscle? Harder. A muscle has to work harder. That's exactly right. So let's look at this. Okay, so if the hips are fully extended at the top, we have less leverage because there's less torque, we can see that gluteus maximus activity is maximized with the hips in a fully extended position. So can you see that? So less mechanical advantage at the top means more activity for the gluteus maximus at the top because that muscle has to work harder to overcome this uh, lack of uh, mechanical advantage. Okay, so what's the practical message here if you're doing that exercise? Then you want to really get the most activity from those glutes. Full you got to get up. You got to get that full extension. So you don't want to be using so much weight that you can't get your hips locked out right at the top. Because at the top is where you're getting the most activity out of the glutes. Okay. Hamstring activity now, flat line all the way through and it's very low. So based on what we talked about in class, hamstrings is a biarticular muscle, acts on the hip, acts on the knee joint. Why would we see very little activity in the hamstrings all the way through this movement? What's the concept? Yes. <laughs> a for the day, everybody. Active insufficiency, what does that mean? Yes, it's shortening over the hip and the knee joint at the same time. So it's shortening so much that it really can't contract to produce productive force. So yes, the hamstrings is active. It's not zero, it's not all the way down here. It's active a little bit, but it's in an actively insufficient position. So uh, alternatively, that's gonna place emphasis on what muscle? Gluteus maximus, right? The hamstrings is actively insufficient, so now all the load is on the glutes, and especially if you're getting up to that fully extended position, that's where you're gonna get that uh, maximal activation from. So that's the practical take home for today. Um, so how are we doing on time? Okay, we're good. So we're gonna end the day here. I'm gonna stop talking, and we're gonna have you work together let me hand this out and then I'll explain it. Activity to go through several of the muscles in the body. So let's read the instructions together. So complete the chart by writing in the distinctive characteristics for which each muscle is named. So this is all about muscle names, such as, okay, so your, your, your categories that you're writing in those blanks would be shape, size, number of divisions, fiber direction, location, and or action. So you have six different choices. Some muscles have more than one. Okay, so for example, adductor magnus is an adductor of the hip joint. Hang on. So you would write action and size. Action and size. Action because it's an adductor. <coughs> What in that name would give you an indication on size? Magnus. Magnus, right? Because there's also a longus and a brevis. Yes, Danny. Oh, do you have another one? Yes. Okay, biceps, brachii. Which of those six descriptors? Number of divisions. The humerus is sometimes called what? Brachium. So it would also be location. Because you also have a what? A biceps what? Femoris. 
Okay, so you take it from here. Talk to each other, just... So you're just flipping it right scan and left scan. Oh. And so then you're just choosing. So this is action. Mm -hmm. And then sets. And same with this one is confidentions and your location. What is your best All right, put so one or two, one or two on each one. Mm -hmm. okay. And then if there's people on the email. Location as well. Yeah. Because your best steps is a location. In that sense, it would, because of its location along the lateral side, near the radius. Use your phones. Go to, go to Google. Look up, look up some of these names. There we go. Look, I know there's something. Uh, some of them based on shape. Like the deltoid is based on shape. Yeah. 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 Try and buy are nice to have because you know. Rhomboid would have to be. based on points of attachment, like digity, mini-me, points of attachment, digity, mini-me. Yes, Yes. 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 Yes.
Uh, shape. There must be some Latin word that deltoides. <laughs> you can look it up. Look it up and see if there's what the word delta would be. Yeah. <coughs> so Tyler looked up deltoid. It means triangular. Got a few? Yeah. Good. Good. When would it be based on the year? Um, shape, size, number, divisions, fiber direction, location, and or action. Oh, if you can look at his knee. Oh, gotcha. Okay. I was, I, I was trying to find it. Spinalis. That has to do with what do you think? Spinalis services. What part of the spine? Cervical. Yeah. Sub usually means above or below? Below. Below. So below what? Clavius is a Good. Okay. 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 I looked it up and then yeah. like, so 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 this is oh, okay. 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 How would it be? Could be I also would say location. Size. I just did location because I'm in 2020. No, but location because it's extended. See, these ones all will be location. Because they're all to do with your fingers. Gotcha. Okay. But not all, I confused myself and have been jumping around, so that worked. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Doing great. <laughs> it's easy as it's got to be shade. Lucy's um, must mean something with the great toe, because 